A nuclear physicist at ISU seeks to raise awareness about the threat of nuclear war with a public seminar series. Physics professor Matt Kaplan organized 12,000 bombs, so named for the number of nuclear weapons stockpiled worldwide. The series kicked off last week with Smriti Kashari's 2016 art house film called The Bomb. WGLT's Lauren Warnicke was there and caught up with Kaplan the next morning. The film opens with stunning images of military parades demonstrating the pageantry behind nuclear weapons. Kaplan says the United States is an outlier and that it doesn't prop up and show off its weaponry in the same way. It is intended to showcase to their people and to the world, we have these and therefore we are to be taken seriously and not to be messed with. Do you think that one of the reasons we don't do that is because we don't have to because we are really the only country to have actually used these weapons? That is certainly part of the psychology. The United States has a very complex and nuanced relationship with its nuclear weapons. We have enough nuclear weapons stockpiled to destroy the Earth eight times. So these are therefore an existential psychological threat more than they are a literal That's absolutely right. And the way that the military often talks about nuclear weapons is they say that we use nuclear weapons every day because nuclear weapons exist to then deter nuclear attacks from other nations. There's an analog that I think Americans relate to, which is firearm ownership, where, well, they have one, so I need one. And, well, they have a bigger one, so I need a bigger one, and I need more. And I need to now open carry and I need my hand on the trigger and I need the safety off and I need to be ready to go at a moment's notice. And when you start to think about this as a way of enforcing peace, it becomes very deranged very quickly and that it's that it's so precarious that no normal or sane person would say that this is a good way to ensure peace, especially given the scale of conventional force that already exists. Yeah, to be really reductive about it, if somebody fires a nuclear weapon at us, we're not firing back. Right. This, I think, gets into the the scenarios and the planning that, that nuclear weapons, when, when would one of these actually be detonated? So there's this Cold War mentality of a full scale nuclear exchange, and that would be with Russia. Russia is the only other power on par with the U.S. There is a kind of escalation that happens where one country invades another and then threatens another country for offering military aid to the invaded country. Then there are strange movements of nuclear weapons as a signal, as a sort of saber rattling. And this kind of saber rattling is exactly what we see happening in real time right now. And this is what I'm trying to do with the speaker series is inform the public because the United States is this unique democracy. And and as a world leader in in so many regards, especially nuclear weapons, uh, U.S. leadership is needed if there's going to be any progress made in disarmament. If we imagine, let's say, the Cuban Missile Crisis and some of that propaganda around duck and cover and bomb shelters are included in the film Mm -hmm. that was shown last night. In hindsight, we look at that and see it as completely ridiculous. Like, oh, just like put your hands over your head, hide behind this building, you'll totally be fine. I'm at this kind of catch-22 where that sounds ridiculous. But if the threat is, as you say, rather high, why are we not preparing ourselves? Is there anything we can do? Or do we just have to accept that this is a possibility? This is a great question. (laughs) So I'll I'll talk just for a second about the 1950s. A lot of this is meant to, to reassure people. And some of it is also very similar to climate messaging, where it's presented as an individual moral failing rather than a systemic and structural issue. Maybe if you are miles from ground zero, ducking and covering saves you from broken glass from a window. Maybe Mm. this would have helped someone somewhere. But I think that that this idea that suburbs are the thing that's attacked is also insidious and is part of the public confusion around nuclear weapons when really it's these hundreds of silos that we have out west near the border with Canada, the missiles would be launched over the North Pole. That's the fastest route to get them to Russia. And there would be these huge plumes of radioactive fallout that can kill millions of Americans. There's this very interesting project that that is ongoing at Princeton uh, called Missiles on Our Land that simulates the tracks that these plumes of fallout take. And the the entire country just is, is at risk, depending on the weather of the day, of being exposed to lethal amounts of radiation. And what am I supposed to do to survive this? Oh, I'm supposed to stockpile iodine pills and clean water. Like if we accept 
that, that nuclear weapons must exist, then Obama says this, then it's, at some level, are we admitting to ourselves that their use is inevitable? So nine countries have, nine countries. have these. May I list them for you? You may. So I've told you that the lion's share of them are held by the United States and Russia. The other nuclear weapon states authorized by the UN that, that are on the Security Council, you have the United Kingdom, you have France, and then you have China. So there are then four countries remaining. So there are India and Pakistan, both with a few hundred. They're also undergoing arms buildup. Their arsenals are largely as deterrents to each other because they have these border skirmishes. Israel has nuclear weapons. They don't publicly acknowledge this. They take a stance of ambiguity, but it's well known that they do. And then North Korea. These are the big ones in the news. We think in the United States that nuclear weapons are this normal thing, and many countries have them. And it's really not. It is these few powers that are trying to extort the rest of the planet into behaving the way that they want. Say if the EU all came together or Australia, or is there some kind of consortium of countries that might place pressure on the nuclear powers to either disarm themselves or make steps toward that? South America has a nuclear weapons free zone. They've signed treaties. Africa as well. In fact, there's there's multiple of these many country consortiums which have all said, we refuse to take part in this game that the United States and Russia has decided is normal. So there's actually plenty of precedent all over the planet for, for these nuclear weapon free zones. Is there any part of you that admires the invention while recognizing the threat. I am a nuclear physicist by training. My technical expertise is in everything from plasmas to nuclear reactions to shock waves, all of the things that coincidentally go into the making of these devices. So it's hard not to have a professional interest in them. They're, it's it's fascinating beyond just history and policy that we discuss. The actual technical makings of these of these weapons are incredibly fascinating. We are already in a post-nuclear world because of all of the testing and accidents that have occurred in the creation of these weapons. So can you reflect on on that a little bit? Because it's something that I honestly didn't know. And I think it is one thread that's part of this series. Yes. Thank you. The, the legacy of testing is one of the most harmful things that came out of the Cold War. And this is something I'm hoping to highlight in the series. We are trying to get Tina Cordova, who is the president of the Downwinders Consortium in New Mexico, to come and speak. These are the people who were exposed to radioactive fallout following the Trinity test. Oppenheimer was seen by half the country, and it doesn't highlight the harm that was done to U.S. citizens by the tests on U.S. soil. The United States is one of the most nuked nations in the history of the world because of the history of testing. And so this affects everyone. If you think of the Cold War and testing as, as, as an actual conflict, hundreds of thousands of people have suffered cancers as a result of this fallout. Those are civilian casualties. Those are people in nations that were completely uninvolved in U.S. and Russia's conflicts. The most egregious part is that it has disproportionately affected people who haven't had a platform and a voice in the United States. It's tragic, and it is a story that goes really untold. And if I can put a spotlight on this, and, and if a few more people can know about this and their struggles to get recognition from the United States government and get funds appropriated for their medical treatment, then that's a success. MIT scientist Natalie Montoya will visit ISU in two weeks to discuss full-scale nuclear war simulations. Additional speakers include experts in arms control and the consequences of weapons testing in rural New Mexico. The series continues periodically through mid-April. ISU physics professor Matt Kaplan spoke with WGLT's Lauren Warnicke.